So, NASCAR. As a car guy growing up in New York City, I can't say I was ever that into it, but it wasn't really a lack of interest, it was a lack of access. Yeah, I had a cousin who was more of an uncle that took me to qualifying at Pocono, but then shortly thereafter, I got bit by the light, fast, and nimble car bug, and that probably explains why in the past six years of this show, we've looked at Le Mans cars and rally cars, and hell, we've even competed in rally. But friends, I feel it's high time you and I change that. What better way to do that than to go to the mecca of the NASCAR World Show at North Carolina and meet with the grandest of grand poobahs in that world, Hendrick Motorsports. Thinking we would go look at some old race cars, talk about some nice moonshiners, call it a day. Well, let's just say that Rick and his crew, they had a different plan. Okay, this may look like something your father taught you way before you got your license, but instead, friends, this is the most important principle of NASCAR. Once I got done gloating about our team's epic win, Andy translated our experience to the key principle of success in NASCAR. We're not a peak performance sport. Uh, you know, it's not like well, you can have a really good run in football and you can run so overwhelmingly dominantly that you can put enough points on the board that you win simply because your run is so good. A real simple example, if we've got a great pit crew uh, at, at the race, drivers driving a great race, crew chief is calling really good strategy, uh, but if we have a problem with the engine, like our day is over, we can't rely on the strength of the pit crew or the talent of the driver or the strategy calls of the crew chief. Our weakest link determines our performance. So in motorsports, we're constantly about shoring up weakness. That's theory. So let's take another look at this. We were three people to change one tire in 19.7 seconds. Now, the pros. Car comes in, right side goes up, gas tank goes in. Change the front tire, change the rear tire. Spent tires go back up over the wall. They come around to the left side. Front tire gets changed, rear tire gets changed. Tires back over the wall, car comes down, 12 seconds. People, 12 seconds. Now as proud as I am to say that I am a distance runner, those guys, all former ball and stick professional athletes. And with that, welcome to NASCAR Today. You know the old saying, a smart man knows his strengths, but a smarter man knows his weaknesses. So I felt it high time that I learned the rules, really understand how things work. Okay, these are the scales? Yes, we use the scales right here. And what, what, what's, the, what's the weight, the ideal weight you're looking for for these things? Uh, 3,300 plus, plus however the much the difference of the driver's weight is. Oh, so they actually weigh the driver separately from the car? Yes. Wow. Uh, drivers that are way over 180. Anything over 180, that's a cutoff point. <clears throat> have to weigh 3,300 pounds. And it goes down in 10 pound increments after that, all the way down to 130, I think. Let's say Danica Patrick, who's fairly light. Yeah, she's on the 130 side. Probably or less. Lighter. She's less than that, but her car still has to meet the, the uh, 3,340 oh, pound minimum I see. I see. Okay. for weight. And are there, are there any other instruments you're using for the uh, for the weight in besides just the wheels? Uh, well, actually, we take all the measurements for the car, uh, the camber, wheelbase, tread width, uh, housing location, things like that, on top of the platform here. And then after we do all those measurements, we'll roll forward onto the scales, and we'll scale the car from here. This actually folds up uh, to no wider than the actual scales itself has wheels on the bottom of it so we can take it and roll it in the back of the truck. And then what's this here? Is this just a, the ramp to get it up? We actually check the, uh, the frame heights of the car back here. They have to meet a minimum of six in the front and eight in the rear for the, for the actual chassis itself. And the body requirements are measured off of the front split and they have a quarter inch window that they have to be in in the green. Wow. And post race they get yellow. So sadly, we didn't pick a great day weather-wise. It was raining for the past two days, and it even rained this morning. That's where these come in. These are track dryers. So basically, it's like a big vacuum cleaner, 
that they go around the track and there's one, two, four, six. Yeah, it'd be great. I'll open up the side. So how does this thing work? It doesn't suck anything, it just pushes air. Oh, so it, it water blows air, it pushes, blows it out. Pushes the water off. Oh my God, look at that thing. It's like a full on race engine in there. So it creates hot air? It doesn't. It doesn't put much hot air down, but it is mostly air to push the water off and the jet dryers come and put the heat in it and it dries it up real quick. That's awesome. And how many of these things do you have? They're going to have like 20 eventually, I and mean, they're still making them. Are these, so this is totally new? Yeah. For this season? Yeah. They just, this is the first time, this first race they brought them out at. And do they go from track to track to track? Yes. This is awesome. A V8 powered vacuum cleaner. So this is the team transporter, or if you're like me and you're from the south, you call it the hauler. The hauler, got it. Hauler. And uh, the hauler transporter has got two purposes. Um, it brings all the equipment, the race cars, the supplies, the uniforms to the racetrack. And then when you get to the racetrack, as you can see here, this is set up like a race shop away from the shop. So two cars fit up top. This, fortunately, is the backup car that they didn't have to use. You only use the backup if you have a problem in qualifying or practice. Yeah. But this car is going to make it safely back to the race shop. The one out on the track is going to go behind here. They're going to load it up top, close it up, fill this with equipment, and head back to Welcome, North Carolina after the race. So you and I have been so focused on the behind the scenes of NASCAR, we haven't focused on today's race. Uh, this was the STP 500, which occurs at the end of every March at Martinsville Speedway in Martinsville, Virginia. Now this circuit is special for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's one of the oldest circuits on the NASCAR Cup Series. And number two, called the Paperclip. Uh, with an oval that is .526 miles, it is the shortest track on the NASCAR Cup Series. Uh, but that's not the only reason why it's special. Uh, what are these guys duking it out for? Fame? Fortune? A trophy? Actually, it's none of the above. These guys are racing for a grandfather clock. So with that, who went home with a clock today? Well, the answer to that question is kind of the reason why NASCAR is unique. From an outsider's point of view, it looks like there's a bunch of guys racing effectively three cars, a Chevy, a Ford, and a Toyota. But in today's case, there were two guys duking it out until the end, Jimmy Johnson and Kurt Busch, both of whom race a Chevrolet SS. But this is where they diverge. Kurt Busch, who races for Stuart Haas Racing, got into a wreck early on in the race. But then he had to fight his way through the pack to get back up to Jimmy Johnson. Jimmy Johnson, who races for Hendrick Motorsports, he led 296 of the 500 laps. But it wasn't until the last 11 laps that Busch took the lead from Johnson to win the race. Far more interesting, we already said that they're both driving Chevrolets. But here are two separate teams both are driving a car with the same chassis and the same engine. So, with that, answer me this. What's NASCAR all about? The car, the team, the driver, or perhaps all of the above. So we started out this film with a profound lesson, which reminds me of a life lesson I learned from my mentor years ago, and that is plan your work and work your plan. That's effectively what NASCAR is. It's a large governing body that kind of sets the parameters for the car, even down to the details of everyone gets gas from the same place, everyone gets the tires from the same place. But that's the point where the individual teams kind of take over. Like for example, here's a guy that's prepping tires. Or here's a guy that's shaving fractions of a second off the overall pit time by gluing the lug nuts to the wheels. But hey, this is life. Shit happens. There's even a guy, tools, and in this case, sort of parts, for when life doesn't go according to plan. So about this point, how many of you still feel that NASCAR is all about ovals and left turns?